Well, last week we began studying the Sermon on the Mount for our summer message series, and we started at the end because in the ending, Jesus clearly places the emphasis on doing his teachings and not merely understanding them. And there's a method to my madness in doing that because it impacts how you read the whole Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus clearly, clearly emphasizes that we are to do this stuff that he talks about. We need this perspective of hearing and doing the words of Jesus as we listen to him address us. And we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5 today, verses 1 through 12. So go ahead and open up your Bible to the New Testament, to the book of Matthew. It is the very first book in the New Testament. And we're going to be in chapter 5. Now, we started at the end of the message last week. That being said... Here's another consideration that we must take into account when it comes to reading Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. We can't do anything, anything without the very beginning of the message, too. Because it establishes God's will towards us, and it lets us know that we are in relationship to God. Now, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, we read this. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds... He went up on a mountainside and he sat down. And his disciples came to him and he began to teach them. As Jesus teaches the crowd, he begins the Sermon on the Mount with blessings. And he blesses the people who are most desperate for them. Those who are mourning, those who are poor, those who are humble, uh, those who are persecuted. And it is significant that we understand that Jesus knows we cannot follow him until we understand we are blessed by him. So I just want to ask you this morning, in God's eyes, are you blessed? Are you blessed? Because being blessed is more important than you might at first think. And here's why. I want to share four reasons why it's more important than we sometimes think that we are blessed by God. First, you need God's blessing in order to practice the words of the Sermon on the Mount. You need his blessing for that. And I'm not just talking about how Christians sometimes glibly say, you know, well, God bless you or have a blessed day. And then they just kind of go on their way without a second thought. I'm talking about... Truly living under the powerful blessing of God in those times when you think you are anything but blessed. These sayings in the opening of Jesus' sermon, they're often called the Beatitudes. And even though Beatitude rhymes with attitude, it comes from a Latin word which means happy. But Beatitude really doesn't refer to your attitude at all. And people sometimes confuse Jesus' blessings with a list of, you know, positive mental attitude steps that we should take. And I'm not saying that a positive mental attitude is not something that's good to have. It is. I'm just saying that's not what Jesus is talking about here. You know, sometimes when people talk to one another, they miscommunicate, don't they? Because even though one person says one thing, the other person kind of maybe interprets that as something else. For instance, I came across an email this last week titled Men Speak. I think it's been around for a while. Maybe you've even seen this before. But it's an article that points out how men don't always say what they mean, right? I think it was an article intended for, you know, as an aid for women to help understand their man a little better or something. But I don't know. But, but this is what it said. I thought this was kind of humorous. When a man says it would take too long to explain what he really means is I have no idea how that works. <laughs> or when a man says... That's interesting, dear. He means, are you still talking? <laughs> when a man says, take a break, honey, you're working too hard, what he really means is, I can't hear the game over the vacuum cleaner. Shut it off. When a man says, oh, don't fuss, I just cut myself. It's no big deal. He means, I probably just severed a limb, but I will die before I admit that it hurts. you got to get over here and help me. <laughs> When a man says, I can't find it, what he really means is, it didn't fall into my outstretched hand, and I'm clueless. <laughs> or when a man says, I heard you, he says, I haven't the, he means, I haven't the foggiest clue what you just said, and I'm hoping desperately I can fake it good enough so that you're not mad at me for the next three days. 
When a man says you look terrific, what he really means is please, please don't try on one more outfit. We're late and I'm starving. <laughs> Any of you ever go through that? When a man says I'm not lost, I know exactly where we are. What he really means is no one's ever going to see us alive ever again. When a man says I don't remember saying that, it's because he means anything I said six months ago is inadmissible in an argument. <laughs> when a man says, I didn't mean that, he means if something I said can be interpreted two ways and one way makes you happy or sad, I want you to think of it as meaning the other thing. Now, that's all funny stuff, I know, but you know, when it comes to Jesus' Beatitudes, we want to make sure we don't misunderstand him. And, you know, He's not talking about that we need to have a good attitude in life here. Jesus is blessing us so that we can know God loves us no matter what we're going through. So over the years, just thinking of an example here, you know, the things that we go through that are sometimes tough where we need to know God is blessing us. And you know, I've done funerals for babies and children. I've done funerals for young men and young women as well as the elderly. If you walk around in any cemetery, you will see tombstones, and on those tombstones are the, the birth years and the, and the days that they died, and then there's usually some kind of sentiment that's put on those tombstones. In fact, Glenn would know exactly what's being talked about here. He and his volunteer crew, they're always going out, and they restore those cemeteries. And, you know, when you think about people going to the cemetery, they go there, and they bury their dead, and they mourn right? We don't typically think of people going to a, a cemetery or to a funeral and really believing that those who mourn are blessed, as Jesus says in his text that we're reading today. And even though I often ask God to bless people in those situations, sometimes it's really hard to believe it when Jesus says that those who mourn will be blessed. But that leads to a second thing in Jesus' opening words that makes me think it's more important to be blessed by God than we sometimes think. Consider the first words out of Jesus' mouth. Blessed are. Blessed are. Isn't it interesting that when Jesus starts out the Sermon on the Mount, he doesn't make some kind of a command. He begins by blessing people, by blessing you, even when you are in the most difficult times of your life. And it's funny how we really don't pay much attention to these first words in the opening statements of Jesus. We just kind of like to skim over that word blessed because we tend to think of the Beatitudes as commands rather than blessings by God. We don't read verse 3, for example, as blessed are the poor in spirit. Rather, we read it as you need to be poor in spirit. You know, we treat the beginning of the sermon as commands. You need to mourn. You need to be pure in heart. But Jesus isn't giving commands just yet. And the first thing he does is offer blessings to people who are there. And so this is what we read in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 11. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for their needs will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. And so when Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, it is helpful for us to understand that the poor in spirit is a word that comes out of the Old Testament from the Hebrew, and it means the Anawim. When the nation of Israel was hauled into exile, not everybody was taken away by the enemy nation. In fact, the enemies of Israel, they actually took into exile only those people who were useful. Everybody else got left behind. And so if you were useful, you got taken into captivity. If you weren't useful, you got to stay there. 
Now, you know that you haven't really experienced an insult until the enemy of your nation comes in and says, we're hauling off everyone who's useful, and then you get left behind. <laughs> How's that for an insult? These were terrible times for the people who got left behind, and they were the pitiful, and they were the poor, and they were the worthless and the pathetic. They were the poor in spirit. Have you ever had an Halloween moment in your life? You know, one of those embarrassing rejection times in your life. I remember when I was in elementary school and we'd be in gym class, right? And uh, we'd be playing softball or, or we'd be playing dodgeball or kickball or something like that. And the teacher, what would they do? They would always appoint the two most popular athletic kids to be the team captains, right? So there was two of them. And then they'd start picking from the rest of the crowd, which I was always part of the rest of the crowd in, in those moments. And uh, if it wasn't gym class, you know, it was always out on the playground at recess, right? When you went through these times. Did you ever go through something like that? Well, if you're an athletic, outgoing, popular type of kid, it was no big deal. But if you were a skinny, non-athletic, shy kid like me, it was always another honoring moment of life. You know what I'm saying? You just stood there as kid after kid after kid got picked to be on the team by the team captains, and uh, you're hoping that soon you'll be one of those who are chosen, but you never are. Once others get on the team, what do they do? It's not just the team captains picking anymore, right? Because they're shouting, pick him, pick him, pick her, pick her. Well, I'll tell you, I've never once heard anybody yelling out excitedly, pick Tyler, <laughs> okay? And then it'd be down to just two of us left, right? And, and at that point, the enthusiasm was always drained out of the team captain's voice. And they'd, go, they'd go, okay, I'll take Tyler. Wait, no, you take Tyler, I'll take the other guy, <laughs> right? Anoween. That was how it went for me. Randy Harris in his book called Living Jesus, he told them the time when he played on his college's intramural softball team. And he said they'd put at least 12 people on these teams because you needed 10 for your team to play, but you know, there was always a couple of people yet who'd always, you know, for one reason or another, that wouldn't be there on game day. <clears throat> so this just kind of assured that there would always be 10 players on a team. So Harris is telling this story in his book, and he tells of the night when he was sitting on the bench, and he looks out on the field, and he notices that there's only nine players out there instead of the regular 10. And he says, uh-huh, that's how I knew I was insulted. It was when I looked out, and my team said, we'd rather play shorthanded than have you out here playing out in the outfield with us. You just stay on the bench. Well, for him, that was an Halloween moment. And we've all had these kinds of moments. Maybe it was when you applied for a job and you didn't get the job. Or maybe it was when you got fired from your job and security is carrying your stuff out to the door as you follow behind them. Or maybe it was when a boyfriend or a girlfriend rejected you. Or maybe your, your spouse left you for someone else and you come home and the, all, all of a sudden the, the house is half empty. Maybe it was when your idea got ignored or when nobody listened to you, or maybe you were cut off in traffic as if you never even existed. Maybe you couldn't make the rent, and to make things worse, you went home and all your stuff was sitting out on the sidewalk. Or maybe you felt rejection by a parent because your grades weren't high enough, or maybe you didn't try out for a certain sport. Honoring moments, they are more than just times of embarrassment. They are those times when you feel rejected and you feel like, what am I going to do next, right? And you feel hopeless, you feel alone, and you don't know where to turn. Well, the crowd that showed up to listen to Jesus on the mountain that day, they were the Anoim. And the first words out of Jesus' mouth were these, Blessed are the Anoim, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, can you imagine what would have gone through your mind if you were one of those people and you heard that come from Jesus' lips? All of a sudden, you, you thought you were pathetic and you were worthless, and Jesus is saying, you are blessed. For those who face rejection over and over again, you are blessed as important in God's kingdom. And Jesus goes on, blessed are those who mourn. For those who mourn, for the young and the aged who you cared about and they died, God's blessing and comfort is with you.
Blessed are the meek. For those who put more stock in God than in themselves, they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled for what they're looking for. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And he says, blessed are the pure in heart, you know, those whose life revolves around God because he's the center of everything. Jesus says that's a blessed way to live. So often Jesus' ideas of the blessed life and our idea of the blessed life, they don't have a whole lot in common, do they? He goes on, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. In an American culture that's all wrapped up with self-preservation and maintaining our rights, you know, it's refreshing whenever we come across somebody who looks out for others more than themselves. And Jesus says, those who are like that, they are blessed, and this is to be our way of life. It's not that we're to think less of ourselves, but we are to think of ourselves less. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus says that it is even possible for you to have a good life when you are persecuted because God has got your back. You are blessed even when people speak falsely against you. You are blessed even when they insult you because he is there. And so what, what's Jesus really trying to accomplish here by blessing the Anawim, the mourners, the peacemakers, the persecuted? What's he driving at? I'll tell you what he's not driving at. Jesus isn't saying, you have to make yourself meeker. Jesus isn't saying, you got to go out and see if you can get yourself persecuted. <laughs> okay? What he's really saying is the third reason why being blessed by God is more important than you sometimes think. Number three, Jesus tells us what the good life really is. Jesus is saying, let me describe for you what the good life is really all about. Because it's different from what you sometimes think. See, we, we think we already know what the good life is all about. It's all about having as much stuff as I need want or it's about you know having the perfect family or it's about being able to retire early or it's about having total security and then Jesus knowing that God loves you and you are in his hands and what Jesus tells us here in the opening message of his Sermon on the Mount is that it's impossible to live out the commands of the sermon without first receiving his blessings if you try to live out the commands of the Sermon on the Mount, and the commands are coming later, but if you try to live those without being blessed by God first, without feeling loved by Him, without knowing that He's got you next to His side, you're going to work away at all this spiritual stuff, and guess what? You will not have a relationship with God. Why? Because you are attempting to win God's favor by keeping this set of rules rather than doing what you do in response to the fact that God already loves you. It's about relationship, not a religion. And it's not an accident that Jesus starts out his Sermon on the Mount with blessings rather than commands. Because see, this stuff that Jesus is about to talk about has more to do with your being in a relationship with him than it does following a bunch of rules that God has just set up. And my question to you this morning again is, do you feel blessed by God so that you can see, really see, what the good life is all about? And listen, you don't have to be at the top of the world before you feel blessed by God. I mean, the fact of the matter is only a couple people can be at the top of the world, right? The rest of us, we're all on a weem. And in a world like that, it's important to know that the poor in spirit are dearly loved by God. And they too can have the good life. Which leads me to one more reason why God's blessing is more important than we sometimes think. The blessing empowers you to live out the commands. It empowers you to live out those commands. When we receive God's blessing, all of a sudden the doors to, to heaven open up for us. When those crowds came out to see Jesus on the mountain and to hear him speak, they were looking for life, and the first words out of his mouth were this, Blessed are. People out on the mountain that day, they were occupied by a foreign country. Many of them were poor. They were the, the marginalized people of society. And Jesus wanted them to know from the very beginning that God loved them, and they were blessed by him, through the, though, even though the rest of the world told them that they were throwaway people. Anybody ever tell you you're a throwaway? Anybody ever tell you that you really don't matter? 
that you would never account or amount to anything, we need a blessing too, don't we? We need a blessing. There's a world out there telling you you're not good enough. The people who came to the mountain that day needed a blessing, and we come to the teaching of Jesus in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, needing a blessing too. There are, there are a lot of commands in the Sermon on the Mount, and through the rest of the summer we're going to look at those commands, but here's the thing. It is impossible to live out the Sermon on the Mount if you don't first understand that you are loved and you are blessed by God. I know we all want to pursue the American dream. We all want what's described as the good life. But Jesus reassures us that the good life can be found even in unexpected places. That it is found in unexpected places. Places of poverty. Places of mourning. Places of struggle. Places of persecution. The good life can be found in these places too because God's love is what produces the good life. His blessing empowers you to live the good life no matter what you're going through. And so in Matthew chapter 5, verse 12, Jesus says, Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. Do you believe that this morning? Great is your reward in heaven. The Sermon on the Mount, it begins with blessings and command, not commands. Blessings, not commands. Blessings for people who usually aren't blessed. Do you believe that you're blessed by God? There are a lot more losers in this world than there are winners, I'll tell you that right now. There are a lot more people who are poor and outside of society than those who are at the top. And Jesus' words are words that have come down through the centuries. And all we got to do is open our ears and listen. Regardless of what the world says, this is the truth of the matter. In God's eyes, you are blessed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for blessing us so that no matter what we go through in life, we can sense your power and your love. We don't need to ask, why me, God? We don't need to wonder why this is happening to me. Why am I having to go through this? We know that you've got our back. We know that you've got us close to your side. So Father, we just pray that you help us to always remember how blessed we are. To not take that for granted. May each person here today sense your presence with them. That you love them. That you are with them. Now it's up to us to respond to that. May we do so out of respect and out of gratitude. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.